Hello and welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Rochelle ferguson Buyahi. coming up in this week's show. After activists supporting him storm Iraq's parliament, we ask who is the Shiite Muslim cleric Muqtada El Sadra? As Lebanon heads towards local elections, one organisation hopes to change the face of the country's politics. Plus, we look at Qatar's efforts to uh, hold the number one spot in camel racing. But first, efforts to salvage Syria's shaky two-month-old ceasefire continue in Geneva this week, with the US Secretary of State John Kerry launching a desperate bid to breathe life into talks. Well, despite some uh, partial truces elsewhere in the country, fighting between government forces and insurgents rages on in the divided city of Aleppo. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights estimates that last week alone, 250 civilians were killed in the violence in and around the city. Catherine Clifford has more. Amateur footage captures the moment a hospital in rebel-held Aleppo is hit by regime airstrikes. Survivors are led away from the rubble, including small children. This was a pediatric hospital, and amongst the dozens killed in the blast was Dr. Maz, the very last pediatrician in rebel-held Aleppo. The UN Human Rights Office condemned, quote, an awful disregard for civilian lives, with yet another medical facility destroyed. These are um, very likely war crimes, um, attacking civilian structures, civilian, especially hospitals, which are singled out in, uh, in the Geneva Conventions for special protection. So these are really horrendous crimes, and uh, nothing's being done about it. Aleppo is currently a symbol of wider Syria, divided. Regime forces seen here in red hold a little less than 50 percent of the city, mostly in the west. Kurdish forces in yellow control the Sheikh Maksud neighborhood, whilst rebel forces in green hold the rest. The regime's current military strategy target hospitals and schools, forcing the population to flee, clearing the way to send in ground troops to push out the rebels. Syria's former economic capital has become President Bashar al-Assad's primary target. It's a very important city. I mean, they lost it about two years ago when they were weaker. And for the regime, which is now stronger, helped by the Russians, it's very important to show that they control uh, what is called, I mean, the, the important section of the country. The eastern part of the city has been out of Assad's grasp for four years now. His forces have relentlessly bombarded this zone in recent days. An altogether different picture to the fragile ceasefire agreed at the end of February. Last week, activists, many of whom support the uh, Shiite Muslim cleric Muqtada al Sadra, stormed through the green zone of Iraq's parliament to protest at a political deadlock. Although he's uh, never held office, al Sadra remains a popular political figure in his country. He shot to fame for leading the Shiite insurgency against the American invasion of Iraq back in 2003, but uh, declined to join the government three years later. Clement Bonaro explains. He's been described as a pest and the most dangerous man in Iraq. Muqtada al Sadr has repeatedly bowed out of politics over the years, only to later return. Sadr was born in 1973 in Kufa in southern Iraq. His father, a prominent Shiite cleric, was murdered on Saddam Hussein's orders in 1999. His family's reputation quickly translated into political power. He emerged as the leader of the Shiite opposition after the American invasion that toppled Hussein in 2003. A fierce opponent of the US and the Iraqi transition government, he formed the so-called Mahdi army, which went on to become one of the most powerful militias in the country with more than 60,000 fighters. The army was disbanded in 2008 after suffering several major setbacks. Muqtada al-Sadr al withdrew from politics as an individual in 2014, but his political movement lived on. In a predominantly Shiite country, Muqtada al-Sadr al built his reputation thanks to his fierce sectarian rhetoric. He helped Nouri al-Maliki become prime minister in 2006 and form an all-Shia government. But he then became increasingly critical of him. Seeking to distance himself from the sectarian violence that rocked Iraq, he briefly fled to Iran. 
He then tried to unite all Iraqis against two common enemies, the Iraqi government and the U.S. We reject the presence of the American army and even the bombings by the U.S. forces. We reject them. We view this as an act of occupation. Sadr has now returned to the forefront of politics as an anti-corruption campaigner. His supporters started rallying in Baghdad in late February to demand more political transparency. The movement quickly gained momentum, culminating in last weekend's invasion of the so-called Green Zone, a walled enclave that serves as the headquarters for the Iraqi regime. With these protests, Sadr and his supporters were able to send a strong message to all political parties and show that they were a force to be reckoned with. They demonstrated their ability to influence political decisions without compromising on their values. Sadr's supporters say they want a more accountable, non-sectarian government. But Americans and Europeans are worried of a widening rift between Shiite factions. Further instability could undermine current efforts to defeat the Islamic State group. Next, for a number of years, Lebanon has been caught up in ongoing political turmoil. Since 2014, the country has been without a president, while no elections have been held for the past seven years. This week, as the country heads towards local elections, an organisation called Beirut Medinity is hoping to reshape the way Lebanese politics is done. Our correspondent Adam Pletz reports. Non-sectarian, non-partisan, composed largely of professionals and respecting of gender parity, the Beirut Madinati political movement is, to say the least, something of an exception in the Lebanese political landscape. Unlike its competitors, it's taken the trouble to print a program. They've even made quantified commitments. We absolutely have to move to efficient recycling, up from 10% to 40% for the recycling of waste. And we want a five-fold increase in green areas because we need this as a green lung for the city. The movement became known by organizing citizens' debates in several districts of Beirut. If we want to preserve the old buildings, we'll waste space. We won't be able to build new, cheaper accommodation. We intend to create new towns. In this way, we can build large towers and new buildings outside the historic districts. Many of the comments illustrate the frustration of the Lebanese with their political class. We suffered 15 years of war. They poisoned us with wheat, with bread, with garbage. And with what more? What do they want from us? We've had enough. Just to tell you, madam, that we hear what you're saying, that we, all of us together, want to change this situation through the municipality. <laughs> The movement seems to have unsettled the local political establishment, something that's evident at this popular Beirut festival. The only candidate who was allowed to speak is from a compromise list which brings together key local parties. The Beirut Madinati candidate was due to speak, but following political pressure, he never made it to the stage. Of course, because we're campaigning hard for elections and becoming increasingly popular among the population, it's scary to some. They fear that our voice is reaching more and more people. And it's a voice that the youth of Beirut are hearing loud and clearly. This campaign fundraising concert sold out. Ziad Hamdan, a big name in the Lebanese music scene, is known for his outspoken denunciation of the political system. It's the start of a new era in Lebanon, where political parties come up with ideas so that you'll no longer vote for families and clans, but for ideas and a program. To succeed, the movement will have to convince some of the 80% of Beirut's inhabitants who usually don't vote in local elections. But even if it's defeated, Beirut Madinati says it will not stop there. Its leaders, volunteers and supporters have set an ambitious goal to rebuild Lebanese democracy. And finally to Qatar, where camel racing remains an immensely popular sport. Following a scandal over children being used as jockeys in some Arab states, Qatar banned the practice. The country is now keen to hold the number one camel racing spot and even offers camels jacuzzis when they're not working. 
thundering along dusty desert tracks at speeds of up to 65 kilometers per hour. Sitting atop their humps, tiny robot jockeys used to whip the camels by remote control, all the while their owners speed alongside, egging them on. Here, owners come to sign up their best dromedary specimens for racing season from December to March. Some breed their own in the hope of better results. 80% of my current camels here is from breeding. I bought camels. They are good camels, but uh, to be honest and very frank, I'm not lucky in buying, but um, I'm lucky in breeding. In a bid to breed the best beasts in the region, Qatar opened this center. Researchers at the Tharb Camel Hospital transfer embryos from the most successful racing camels, and the first batch are already trained and ready for the track. But getting to this stage required all new research. At least in the Western world, camels are not considered as a traditional species, so there, there hasn't been a lot of emphasis in research. And therefore, uh, establishing techniques such as embryo transfer or in vitro production of embryos is more difficult because the species has some very, very peculiar aspect of its reproduction and the research is a little bit lagging behind. Camel racing's big business in Qatar and the country's clearly intent on racing to the forefront of the industry. Between races, these camels spend their time in their very own jacuzzi pool their personal relaxation and workout space to keep them in prime condition. Well, that's all from the Middle East Matters team for now. See you at the same time next week.